So before I get started, I have to do a Josh Long trick. He made me commit to doing this. I'm going to get a quick selfie of all of us. <laughs> I, I suck at selfies, so I'm going to try to get my top of my head and everybody else in there. I need just one more to make sure. Okay, cool. I'll tweet it later. <laughs> So for those who don't know me, and you shouldn't probably know me, I'm not really that well known in the industry, but I was with SpringSource for quite a while. Um, I joined SpringSource in 2008 uh, because I sold my company Covalent to them. That we brought Tomcat and the Apache web server to SpringSource, and of course, then SpringSource ended up at VMware, and I stayed with VMware for a couple of years afterwards. And you'll hear the history of the company in just a minute, Lightbend, previously TypeSafe. Maybe you probably know us as TypeSafe. But uh, I went from VMware to TypeSafe in 2012. So I thought Mike, Michael suggested this last night, that I would give you kind of a quick overview of the history of the company. Because I think it's not just relevant for you know, what we're about, but more importantly, kind of what we're seeing, what's the evolution of technologies around the JVM, right? And certainly Spring and the Spring technologies have changed a lot in the last four years. And of course, we, TypeSafe Lightband, have brought a lot of new technologies to the JVM as well. And I think our history kind of help, helps explain that. This will probably take me, depending on how fast I talk, 15 minutes or so. And then what I really wanted to share tonight is we just published today, actually it's probably not even out yet in Singapore, but it's coming out in, in the US today, a survey, results of a survey we did that was 2,100 developers and architects around technologies that they're using and planning to use going forward. So things like containers, Docker, and um, of course, <clears throat> excuse me, using technologies like ours to build microservices, technologies like Spring. So it's, it's a, a deck. I haven't even used it before, so it'll be the first time, but it's the results of that survey. So I thought it'd be interesting. Um, company was formed in 2011 by Jonas Bonaire and Martin Odersky. And Martin is the founder of Scala. He also happens to be a full-time professor at the EPFL University in Lausanne, Switzerland. He still works for the company, and he still is a professor, so he's got two, two full-time jobs. And then Jonas Bonaire is the founder of Akka. I'm sorry, I should have said Martin founded Scala, of course, and we'll get to the history of Scala in a minute. And Jonas founded the Akka project, and the two of these gentlemen came together in 2011 to form what was TypeSafe at the time. And as you'll see in just a second, they formed the company after the technologies had been already in the market, already adopted. In fact, <coughs> Scala goes all the way back to 2001. First release 1.0 came out in 2003. Anybody here use first release of Scala? You probably didn't want to. Um, or even 2.0 probably didn't want to. It was probably 2009 or 2008 maybe before it got to a point where you could really utilize it. Um, but this is an interesting kind of graphic because it shows that this is not a new technology, this language. It's been around for quite a while. Martin started this project at the EPFL initially as a research project to prove that you could take functional programming and object-oriented programming, put them together in a single language on the JVM, and give developers a choice right, to use whichever they wanted. He also wanted to make sure that it, it was a, an advanced language at the time where it utilized all of the resources available, hardware that had multi-cores. I mean, CPUs that had multi-cores. That was hard to do in the Java world back then. The rest of these are also the languages. Um, and it's, you know, some of these have done really well. Some haven't. Kotlin's picking up speed. Closure's kind of stalled a bit. But they're still out there. Groovy, of course, that was a Spring source technology. We acquired that at Spring. Um, it's now a separate project again. As of this latest uh, survey that's done by Redmonk, Scala is the number two language on the JVM. Still pales in comparison to Java, though. We're not quite 10%, probably between 8 and 10%. So still very small compared to Java. But it is the number two language on the JVM. The first real commercial use of Scala happened in 2009. And this was, uh, for those of us who watched the World Cup in 2008, remember Twitter, if you used Twitter back then, you saw a lot of fail whales, right? The thing just crashed all the time because people were trying to tweet about the games and couldn't because literally the system couldn't stay up. So Twitter made the decision to re-architect the services that they built all in Scala on the JVM. And so that started, I think it started early 2008, made it public in 2009, and that was really the first time you started to see people using Scala as a language on the JVM in kind of commercial use, if you will, as opposed to just research. You know, up until then, You'd find Scala in 
universities. Stanford's been using it for years on their, um, um, I just lost the name of it, but anyway, it's their uh, high parallel computing platform for testing hardware. They use Scala as a language to prove it can uh, perform really well. And other universities, same thing, have been using it for years, but not commercial customers, not companies, you know, building applications. And not just, uh, the result was not just that the, the site didn't go down or the service didn't go down, but they actually saw a huge improvement in performance, and that was one of the objectives as well. This still predates TypeSafe. TypeSafe doesn't exist yet in 2009. 2010, you started to see a whole lot of other companies picking up the technology or picking up Scala. Um, a lot of you know, big web 2.0 web companies, whether it's LinkedIn, Box, uh, Tumblr, Meetup, you know, these companies started adopting it. Then you saw some commercial, typical financial industry, industry uh, companies like US, UBS, sorry, HSBC, Morgan Stanley, JP Morgan. Uh, many of these companies pick up languages early in their, their life. Most of them chose to use Scala because they had some performance requirements and they wanted to get you know, much more performance than they were getting out of, out of just Java on the JVM. Again, this still predates the company. We don't exist yet. Akka similarly started before TypeSafe. Akka was born in 2009. Jonas was trying to create, trying to solve two problems. He wanted to solve uh, the, the biggest problem of which was high concurrency on a web-based application. How do you build a system that can handle massive amounts of concurrent users and scale both horizontally and vertically? And he also was trying to solve a problem for, for just native cloud-based runtimes, if you want to call it a runtime. And I come from Spring, as I said, and I also came from, from Covalent, which is the company behind Tomcat. Tomcat's still the largest container, if you want to call it that, in the Java market. It doesn't do real well in a cloud-based cloud environment. Sure, you can run it on Cloud Foundry. There's lots of ways you can try to make it scale, but it is not natively built for that kind of use case where you're going to run it across a, a cluster in the cloud. Akka was designed with that in mind from the get-go. And then a big moment in history for the company, I joined. <laughs> so. <laughs> Um, it's, it's a company was around for more than a year before I got there. I knew about it within two weeks of when it was founded. It was founded in February 2011, and the reason I knew about it because at VMware, one of my jobs was to look at other technologies that we were seeing in the market and potentially acquire them. We did five acquisitions while I was there. We looked at 37 companies in the two and a half years I was there. This was one. I tried to buy the company. It didn't happen, thankfully. <laughs> it didn't happen. <laughs> they said no. But that's how I knew about them. And then a year later, fast forward, they were looking for a CEO. Uh, obviously, Martin couldn't be the full-time CEO as a professor. And uh, the VCs were looking for somebody who had some experience in open source and building businesses around open source. And they, they found me. So it was perfect, at least in my eyes, it was perfect match. Um, the first thing I did, there's actually a slight reversal here. I'll come to it in just a moment. But the first big thing we did publicly was we embraced Java. Um, Akka works with Java. There's a Java API, and we'll talk about Play in a minute. Play works with Java as well. The company at that point, and still even a couple of years after, was known as the Scala Company, right? TypeSafe and the name TypeSafe has a lot of meaning to Scala and, and programmers in Scala. We are very invested in Scala. Everything we build is built in Scala. But we, if you look at our customers and our technology stack, it serves the Java market. In fact, our customer base is more Java than it is Scala. So it's, it's, uh, it was important for us to make that shift. And it, it's, it's not just a shift in message, it's a cultural shift. Right? You can imagine anybody who's been using Scala and is a fan of Scala, once you've decided to go that way, it's hard to go back. It's hard to say, OK, Java's OK, or I'm going to use Java. So we, we went through an internal kind of turmoil, if you want to call it that, of just accepting that Java was good enough. And actually, great, now that you have Java 8, much better. Play Framework, this actually happened before I joined. I was still helping the company, or I was helping the company before I actually made it here uh, full time, and we did this acquisition. So Play came out of a small company in Paris uh, called Zenexity. They changed their name since then. And they designed the Play Framework. We acquired the IP, paid them to build Play 2.0, which had uh, more Scala support, and of course just is the version of Play that's available today. So that gave us a web framework. So prior to that, we had the Akka, um, framework and tool set, and then of course we had Scala the language. This gave us much more of a platform. The, the next big challenge for the company was to try to define what's the market, what's the category we're going after. And you know, we could just say we were the, the next spring source, or we're a better spring source. We're not, and we weren't. We were trying to solve a different set of problems, and today I think both of us are converging, but at the time, 
the challenge was how do you describe it? And most of you probably heard of this thing called the Reactive Manifesto. We published it now three years ago, July 2013. It was written by Jonas Bonaire. Um, the initial version was written by Jonas Bonaire. And when we published it, this was our objective, was to define what does it mean to be reactive? How do you define this next generation of applications in a consistent way or nomenclature that you can all agree is the right way to describe it? And these four key tenets kind of make up what reactive is all about. It's message driven, it's elastic and resilient, and of course it's responsive. And responsive could be an end user application with a web page or a phone app, or it could be responding to just server services on the back end, not necessarily having a UI. But these are the four tenets. And if you haven't read the manifesto, actually, there's another slide here. Um, if you haven't read the manifesto, it's about two and a half pages or something like that, maybe three pages. It's reactivemanifesto.org. We encourage you to read it. <coughs> when we published it, or when Jonas published it, it didn't say type safe or light bend or anything on it. You didn't know it was us. That was intentional. We were trying to see if we could get other vendors to say, yes, this is the right way to, to describe these kind of new applications and the way they should be designed. And we succeeded, I and mean, you can see that here. So P Pivotal, which hasn't, hadn't been, actually it was Pivotal by then, I'm sorry, in 2013. IBM, Red Hat, VMware, Microsoft, and all these companies said, yes, this is the right way. Three months after we had published the first version, uh, 2.0 came out. And in 2.0, there was tons of contributions from these vendors, as well as other individuals in the industry uh, that said, yeah, you're not quite right. There's a few ways you could describe message-driven versus event-driven in a little bit better way. Uh, but the good news is this 2.0 came out with a, a lot more support. It's an open source project itself. You can see it on GitHub. You can contribute to it. There's lots of comments on it. Um, and I'll stop talking about it, but that's, that's the manifesto. Next big news was 2014, we adopted Spark as part of our offering. And Spark, for those of you who don't know, I'm sure, how many people here have used Spark or have some experience with it? Like half, that's great. Spark is written in Scala. Um, and there's a whole bunch of other technologies that is in this new reactive fast data world that also are written in Scala. Kafka, written in Scala. Uh, parts of SAMHSA, Beam, and a whole bunch of other technologies, Mesos, or Mar Marathon on Mesos. Scala happens to be the language of choice for a lot of infra infrastructure projects, things that get used in this new world. Well, we adopted Spark as part of our, our offering because developers were using it in their applications, not just the data scientists who are running Spark <coughs> jobs. We're not serving that use case. We, don't, we can't. You know, we're not Cloudera, we're not Hortonworks, we're not one of those companies. But we can help people who are building applications, like an ad-serving app or something like that, where Spark is part of it. And that's exactly what we offer support for. The next big news, 2016, we changed the company name. Um, I alluded to this a minute ago as to why we changed it. There really were two reasons. And by the way, I wrote some blog posts if you're really bored some night and you want to read them. May of 2015 was the first one, and then there was two or three others after that, about why we were changing the company name and the process. We were very open about it. We talked about it publicly, which was both good for us to kind of get feedback, but it also allowed people to kind of come to terms with it, right? If you're Scala developers, you probably love TypeSafe, right? Am I right? Any other Scala developers here? I don't know a single Scala developer who did not like the name or love the name TypeSafe. They all loved it, right? But it was a funny joke to call the company type safe and invent actors. <laughs> <laughs> Point made. So actors, <laughs> that's not the reason we changed it, but it is, it's a contributing factor. Um, yes, so, but type safe, most people thought of Scala when they heard type safe. It was kind of natural, right? Type safety and Scala. And we are more than Scala. We serve Java, and we are inten intending to try to serve the Java market. And it was really hard to get that message across with a name that really spoke to Scala. And the second reason that drove me crazy is people misspelled it. We were typeface all the time. <laughs> I mean, there's an article, they fixed it, but there was an article that came out. They interviewed me in 2013, and they put in big, bold letters right across the top, typeface, Java, the JVM gets typeface. And I'm like, First off, that doesn't even make sense. But secondly, you know, we're not type safe. I mean, not typeface. <laughs> so that kind of stuff just drove us crazy. So we changed the name. And Lightbend doesn't speak to Scala, doesn't speak to Akka, doesn't speak to any technology. It's not supposed to. It's supposed to be a name that's memorable, but it's supposed to be thought provoking, but not tied to the technology, right? So that was big news. And at the same time, we changed the company name. This was February this year. We launched a new product, a microservices framework for Java 
Today it's Java only. It does not support Scala. It will. It does not support Scala yet. Um, Legom. And anybody know what Legom means? Legom is a Swedish word, which means just right. Perfect size. Not small, not large, not medium, but perfect. Just the right amount. So those, those, the name change and the launching of Legom were intentionally done at the same time because we wanted the, the world, the Java world, to recognize this company, but also see that we, we had a product, a software project that was available for Java developers. And so that's what Legom is all about. OK, um, I'm going to flip through this next couple slides fairly quickly. But we talk about reactive. This is not a sales pitch, but this is a, it's an impressive slide. Right? These are all companies who use our technology in production today. And every one of them is a customer, meaning they have bought our offering, our subscription. In the open source world, we all know this in Spring. Of course, you're probably all consumers of Spring technologies. There's literally tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of companies who use your software. Not all of them buy your product, your subscription offering. Every one of the ones on here has bought our subscription. And we've grouped them by kind of business case. What was driving them to move to a reactive way of building applications? And these, I would say, these three here in the middle was where we lived for the first three, two and a half years of, of my being at the company. New projects, greenfield projects, an IoT-based system like the precision agriculture system at John Deere, completely built from the ground up. Or down here, Verizon. This is the new Go90. Anybody use Go90, the platform where you can watch streaming video on your phone with Verizon? So it's a service they built. It's a video streaming service that wasn't even in existence uh, more than 18 months ago. And then new market expansions. This is usually taking some platform and making it available to a new audience, like DirecTV. This is when they launched their uh, service for iPhone and iPads. Uh, that you know, you previously was only available on the set-top box. Um, obviously, that's an American company, so you probably don't know much about it here. But Or Major League Baseball. This is an interesting one. What do you think of when you hear Major League Baseball? They probably have content for people playing baseball, right? Well, they built this amazing video streaming platform that now they've licensed to HBO. HBO is, uh, if you watch Game of Thrones online, that's being run on Major League Baseball's streaming video platform. So they've actually spun out a company from Major League Baseball that does nothing but serve content for video. <coughs> so, excuse me, that's where we lived, those three groups there. The other two, especially the one on the far right, is kind of where we're seeing more adoption today. And it's simply put, where companies are taking their existing applications and either adding some new services in a microservice way, you know, adding some new functionality, or they're breaking it down, breaking that big monolithic application into smaller microservices based. Um, and so you can see some of the companies there. But there's quite a few that have embarked on that. All right. Did you have a breakdown of Java versus Scala adoption? You know, I could, I could rattle them all off. I think initially it's about 60% are Java. Um, what happens, though, over time, as you would expect, is people start to play around with Scala. Um, so there's a couple companies I'll mention real quick. Um, UBS was all Java initially, and then they shifted, so they have a little bit of Scala now. Um, Fidelity was all <coughs> Java with Akka and Play, and then they picked up some Scala sets. So just over time, they, they see some opportunities, or they just want to learn a new language. It might be because they saw a sample app, or they picked up a library that there's recommended or, or highlighted in play, and they start using Scala because of that. Yeah, I'm sorry. I should have said interrupt me if you have any questions. Uh, OK. So what is our platform? Well, it's an open source based platform. I've talked about a couple of technologies. In fact, here, just to show you, this is the open source technologies that we provide. Obviously, we're not the authors behind, sorry, I keep walking over here. Uh, we're not the authors behind Java. We support Java. The rest of this is part of our platform. Spark, of course, we can't own it. That's an Apache project. But the rest of these are all completely driven by Lightbend and the community around our Lightbend mm -hmm. technologies. What we sell is a whole platform that gives you not just that technology, but we license it to you under commercial terms. We give you support. We give you. Um, some tools or functionality for production that are not available in the open source. Things like orchestration, monitoring, and, and that's part of the product that you buy under our subscription. All right, so that's it for the sales pitch. Questions? All right, that's the history of the company. I'm going to jump to the survey results while I'm doing that. Anybody have any good jokes to tell? I have a question. Sure. Um, 
So if, if I'm spinning up a development team in, in China, can you guys find the right architecture for my use case? Can you guys help me, or is it just licensing? Yeah. So we provide a product that is under a subscription, and we provide training and consulting as well. Our, our subscription includes classic support, but we pride ourselves on the fact that we go much further than the normal brake fix when something's broken. Anybody here have a subscription from Lightbend? That's that we need to fix. Um, <laughs> but the experience that you should expect is that we're going to help you be successful with your development project, if you're in development, obviously. It's, and, and you know I can speak to Springsource because I brought it to Springsource. For the last 17 years of my career, I've been in open source. And the one thing I know is if you don't deliver great value around the technology, and I'm not just talking about software, but great experience, they're going to stop paying you, right? The customers are going to say, I got support for the first couple of months. It worked. I'm done. I don't need your help anymore. So we pride ourselves on the fact that we will continue to um, move with the support that you need, right? So to, at, at the start, it might be architectural help. It might be just like the question, I need somebody to come in and help me design my system. But then when you get into development, we're going to help you with development and knowledge transfer. When you get into just building the application and you have questions on what's the best way to do it, we're going to give you advice on that. And finally, when you go into production, we're going to help solve problems when they go into production. So that's the support side of it. And then, as, as uh, I said earlier, there is also... Uh, training and consulting. If you want some help for building an application and you want to bring somebody in from Lightbend, we'll do that. We have a lot of partners, and Zeneca is here. I don't know where Michael went. Oh, it's right here. So Zeneca is a partner. They do training for us. They do consulting around these technologies as well. Okay. So I mentioned this report. It literally came out or comes out today. Uh, it's available off our website. So if you go to the website and look for it, We've done, this is the fourth one we've done in the last two years. Uh, we've done reports or surveys on just what technology you're using on the JVM, very generic ones. We've uh, done ones on what, what are you using for, for data, data manipulation, are you using Spark, are you using things like Flink or, or uh, Hadoop and other technologies. So uh, we, we do these about every six months. This one was targeted at developers. Uh, we got a decent amount, you'll see, a decent amount of, of input from architects and management, not just developers. Developers know us, right? And they're the ones that we're mostly engaging. But um, starting to see more and more um, architects and management folks at companies looking at these technologies. Our objective with this one was really to understand what's happening with cloud, um, or people actually deploying real production applications in the cloud. Are they using containers yet? If they are, what are they doing with them? Is microservices real? Is it something people are really implementing or building today? And then what kind of tools around microservices are they using? And finally, what about data in motion, streaming, instead of data at rest that's written at disk, seeing data that's actually being dealt with while it's in flight? So the, <coughs> excuse me, the audience, uh, well, this gives you a pretty good estimate. Uh, half, 52% were small startups, kind of typical of what you'd expect. That's the people that you know, know us, love us. But 28% uh, up to 5,000 people, and 20% with 5,000 or more people. And here's the breakdown of people. 50% developers, 27% architects, 16% management, and 7% other. The interesting thing is in the large companies, 5,000 plus, uh, 60 percent, 59 percent of them were architects. So that's a smaller group, of course, but there are more architects there than there were developers. Here's the key findings, and we'll come back to these. I'm just going to talk through each of these with the data. But number one, microservices and fast data are absolutely driving uh, modernization efforts. They're, whether it's taking an existing application and, and changing it to be a, a streaming-based app or a microservices app, or building something new, you know, something brand new. Containers, when I say containers, generally speaking, we're talking about Docker, but you know, uh, Linux kernel containers are challenging or changing the way people think about deploying their applications. It's no longer the app server, right? So I mentioned Tomcat. I'm very familiar with it. Uh, could be JBoss, could be WebSphere, could be WebLogic. Any of those containers are being replaced with things like Docker and enabling people to do more microservices, but also just enabling a more uh, portable piece of software that I can move things from you know, cloud or on-prem to different, different infrastructure with a lot more ease. And then finally, the benefits of, of cloud of flexibility of driving applications to the cloud really are forcing people to rethink 
the way they build their, their system. So if you're going to start with the cloud as the way you're deploying it, it's pretty easy. But if you don't know if you're going to go to the cloud, you might architect it in a way such that it'll be much easier to move it to Amazon or Azure or somewhere else in the future. All right, so the first one we'll talk about is microservices and data streaming or fast data. Um, I don't have to repeat this, but these... Actually, I will, because reactive is an umbrella kind of construct where microservices, fast data, all these kind of uh, use cases or technology uh, movements fit. They fit under the reactive umbrella. They, they meet these requirements, right? So <coughs> we're not talking about something di distinct from reactive. Reactive just is a, an umbrella over all of them. So one of the questions that was asked was, what's the main reason why your organization is embracing microservices? And interestingly enough, or maybe not so interesting, is that the top two were all about kind of productivity, right? So faster, safer deployments for ops, and then developer velocity of getting software out, whether it's new releases or maintenance to existing applications or services. And then you started to see things like elasticity driving it, um, just more resilient, more fit, fault tolerant, right? And then lastly is the, you know, I'm planning to deploy this in the cloud, and so microservices makes that a lot more uh, tenable or easier. Again, stop me if you have questions. I probably don't know the answer, but I will at least uh, try to come up with something. So what describes your adoption of microservices? This is, you know, there, there were lots of other answers here. I don't think they're listed, but this is a little white slot at the top, but are you, are you building things that are in production already? If you look at the service-oriented architecture, the precursor to, to microservices, how many real production systems were ever built successfully? I don't know the number. I'm just curious if anybody has a guess. It's a small percentage of what was talked about, right? Not a lot of people actually made it and got an SOA-based system out and running in production. An awful lot of money was spent, an awful lot of energy was spent, but not a lot of success. In you know, literally just a couple of years, already 30% of the people who responded to our survey are running microservices in production today. They're already there. And then there's 20 more percent, so half total are seriously piloting, building something, planning to deploy something into production. And then you have the rest. So sandboxing as well as kind of sort of interested or not interested at all. But clearly, this is a big, big real movement. It's not just something people are talking about. They're actually doing it. Just, uh, just a question. Um, so very often when we talk about microservices, we see examples such as Twitter, or Facebook, yep. like those big product companies. Yep. If I work for a bank, do you think I should use microservices? If I just have like, a simple app? Yeah. Um, it's not so. I mean, um, there is always a way to use microservices. I mean, for example, cache, it's a good example of microservices. If you hide something like IRS Pike or code base uh, over your service, it allows you to provide some very light serializations and rules. It is a microservice. For banks, for example, I worked for bank. Uh, we had. Uh, <coughs> Geo microservice, geo locations. It's your ATMs. Uh, you don't need to put it in your monolith application. I mean, and everyone, everyone desires to have it as a separate uh, thing, and so on and so forth. Yeah. I'm sorry. No. So yeah, I would just yeah, reiterate what Dimitri said. That there is, there are use cases where it doesn't make sense, right? Where it just flat out isn't. Uh, isn't the right way to build your application. Or it works today, and there's no need to break it down into microservices. Maybe it, if you started from scratch today, you would have done so. But not every monolith needs to be broken down into microservices. In banking, we see an awful lot of it. Um, but it's partially because they do a lot of iteration of new systems, whether it's replacement of the old or it's just something new, right? Some new trading platform or some new risk management tool or risk assessment tool. Uh, so we're seeing an awful lot of microservices work in, in the financial. As you saw some customer names, but in the financial industry, there's an awful lot of it. Could I add one more? Idea? Sure. Uh, frankly, it is a really tricky thing because when we started to use microservices in bank, we were a little bit confused when we tried to build, for example, customer microservice. But all of your activities are about customers, and you don't know how to segregate it, how to build loosely coupled the system if all the payments are about customers, internet bank, customers, and so on and so forth. 
But if you try to look at your system with a, a different angle, uh, not with the angle of customers, but with the angle of functionality, you will see that payments is one uh, part, uh, deposits is another part, something like promo, uh, different uh, action, advertisement is quite a separate <coughs> thing that could be, could, that could be uh, separated. <coughs> so it is just the way how do you see on your system, how do you look at your system. Thank you. Okay, uh, another question was asked was, what's the overall data processing systems or practices you have today? And so this was really a, a kind of a binary question. Is it batch um, or is it is it real time, you know, data streaming? And so you can see that at the far right, there's mostly real time, 35%. That's pretty impressive. You have to take into consideration the people that answered these surveys, right? These are people that know, at least have heard of us probably. But that was still a much bigger number than we thought. This is people who are already building systems that are dealing with data in flight, data as it moves, right? Not data just that's being queried from a database. And then the second one, mostly batch, a little bit of real time, so similar numbers. Um, and then split with the 21% between the two. And then finally, it's very small, right? Only, you know, only seven or 13% between all batch and, and all, oh, that's real time, sorry, only 8% is all batch. Right? So very small that said, we don't do anything uh, except data that's at rest and we do batch processing against it. So, so that was a, a surprise for us. And then the second part of that question is, oh, actually this is combining the two, sorry. It's asking the question about, are, are you already using microservice in production and are you using data processing um, in batch, I'm sorry, in streaming mode in, in uh, production already. So similar, and, and you'll see if you read the report, there's a lot of context here, but most of the people who answered yes to this one, the first one, also happened to answer yes to that one. So the correlation is very tight between the two. Again, probably that's not too surprising. This was a complicated one, not just to put the slide together, but a complicated one to get, you know, kind of dig down into. But what's your experience with different data streaming uh, technologies? And I'm not going to give you a, a primer on the different ones. There's a great small little booklet that Dean Wampler, Dean Wampler is one of our CTOs at the company. He's well known in the data industry. He's worked with Spark and Hadoop Technologies and Kafka for quite a while. He wrote a great little book that's free. I encourage you to download it. So O'Reilly published it. You can get a link from our website that goes through all the different streaming technologies, everything from Spark Streaming to uh, Storm, Flink, Samza, and of course, Aka Streams and Kafka as well. But I'll give you one point here that Kafka is generally used for data that's coming in from some source, right, and uh, via topics. And Aka and Spark Streaming are generally dealing with streams of data that's being processed, right, so in the app. Itself, in the ser between the services or in a service. And then Storm similar. And then anybody heard of Flink or using Flink? <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> so Flink is fairly new. It's Apache project. Happens to all be built in Scala and Akka. So it uses Akka. And Samza uh, is written in Scala as well. And there's one more that's not here. It's Gear Pump. Anybody heard of Gear Pump? It's uh, Intel started it or built it. It's, it's based on Akka. It's distributed Akka essentially. So doing Akka across the cluster. Uh, but this, so I won't try to go through all the data here. This tells us that, you know, Kafka's got a lot of use, right? So Kafka using a production already 18%, 28% um, evaluating, where Aka streams, nobody else is even close there when it comes to production. Uh, and then evaluating, you see similar numbers. Most people just hadn't heard of Samza or Flink yet, the people at least we surveyed. So let's talk about containers really changing the way people think about deploying their applications. Who's using Docker already? About half again. Um, in production or starting? Anybody in production with Docker? <coughs> cool. That's great. So it's, yeah, it's, it's supported by these numbers. This is probably not a surprise that most of the users of Docker are new applications kind of fits with what I said earlier. You know, it's, it's Greenfield, it's new, they're using all new technologies. But this is pretty impressive. 41% of existing applications, people are looking at a way to either make them more portable or break them into microservices and deploy them on, on Docker or both. Uh, but 41%, that was an impressive number. Again, we didn't expect that one at this early stage. 
why are you looking at containers? I don't think this is a big surprise, but um, or not, sorry, not why yet. We'll get to that. Uh, what, what's the interest? Is it, you know, are you playing around? Are you actually in production? We already saw those numbers. Or are you not interested at all? So clearly, from here up, you know, that represents 70%, 74% of the market that, that, or of the people that answered the survey. So it's real. It's not just people guessing or pretending to play with it. They're actually going to do something real if they haven't already. Then the orchestration side of things. Which orchestration tools are you depending on today? This is actually as of now. Um, no, I'm sorry, it's not. The as of now question, I don't have a slide on. So as of now, Mesos is 22%, then it's Docker Swarm at 28%, and then it's Kubernetes at uh, 19 So that's people who've actually deployed something already. I don't have a slide, but if you do look at the report, you'll see that data. This is where you're going. And I, I thought this was interesting. You know, Docker, of course, is making Swarm really tied to Docker. And so therefore, if you're going to be using Docker, it's going to be easier probably to adopt Docker Swarm than others. But Marathon, Mesos, we certainly see a lot of that, especially in the fast data world where you're doing data streaming. I mentioned that Verizon app and the uh, Major League Baseball app. Both of those are running on Mesos as the, as the container resource management layer. Nomad, I have yet to see Nomad, but clearly some people are using it. Anybody using anything else that's not listed up here to manage your containers? Anybody using Kubernetes yet? No? OK. We're starting to see Kubernetes show up a lot more. Sorry, two questions or two people? For development. For development. You're using Kubernetes? OK. But are you planning to use it in production? No, just for development. OK. Uh, would you use something else in production? Would you deploy it on, on Swarm or, or on Mesos or something else? So we package the application. So those are fixed servers. Yeah. So only for uh, development boxes, we use Kubernetes, Docker, and Kubernetes. OK. So but when you're done with the app, it doesn't need to run on the uh, orchestration so tool? We are not there yet to actually view the Docker image to the production. We are Got still it. giving the application RPMs to the production. Got it. OK. Somebody else yeah, I think the, the statistics is a bit skewed. So if you ask a general Docker user base, yep. uh, you would see more Kubernetes than, do you think than so? anything else. Uh, I think so. Well, what do you think skews it? I'm really interested because you know, our audience is. Uh, developers? Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, versus DevOps and just right. people in general, right. especially not JVM languages and so on. <coughs> So that data is probably in this survey. We should look at it and see if like, the architects or the management folks give a different answer than the developers. Um, Maybe Docker Inc. actually did a similar survey. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've seen Docker surveys. There's interesting ones there. I mean, the, they show Swarm being like pretty much everything that people are using. And you know, it's just like if you were to ask all of our people who use um, Akka uh, what frameworks, or if they're, if they're using Play, what other frameworks are they going to use? They're probably going to use Akka. They might use you know, things that are related to us, right? So. OK. Um, so let's talk about the benefits of moving to the cloud and why people are, why people are doing this. Uh, so the first question we asked is, you know, where are you? And this, this data actually is really interesting when you look at the size of company. So when you looked at those 5,000 plus employee companies, most of them are over here, either here or here. In fact, they're planning to go here, but they're on-prem primarily. They're not in the public cloud, right? Not a lot of banks are in the public cloud yet with, with much of their application workload. Um, they might have a private cloud, right? They might have set up a cloud foundry or something in, internally. But public cloud, you see that obviously in lots of startups. You know, PayPal, public cloud, right? Um, I'm sure there's many other companies here that are using a public cloud. So these numbers were not that surprising. Um, <coughs> <laughs> this, the answer to this question was interesting. To see 40% didn't know what a hybrid cloud was, right? Um, didn't expect that. But when you look at the developers, and a lot of them are in startups, they don't think about Amazon, or they think about maybe Azure or Google, but they don't even think about the concept of building something that's going to run in production on physical infrastructure that they host. They're putting it up on, you know, on a public cloud. Uh, and then you, you can see these yourself. But some in production and hybrid. Uh, and this is where the data really got interesting. 
this is, this is where enterprises are, the banks. You know, they're actually moving to a cloud-based. And I can tell you that even financial services companies are looking to start moving some of their services or applications to public cloud. Of course, they're going to make sure they're secure and, and accessed only by the people that are supposed to have access, but they're planning to run them there because they want to stop having to manage all that infrastructure, deal with the, you know, the operations side of things. And then similarly, this group, so these two are kind of the same, but you saw a lot of people either already using hybrid cloud uh, or planning to out of these big corporations, the larger ones. Startups were generally, you know, all cloud only. Uh, yep. I mean, yourself came from an EMS. So what, what do you think hybrid cloud will look like? Because you can see both the sides. Right? Yeah. Uh, different than what we thought of VMware, at least while I was there. And what we thought was going to happen was people would build, they would take something like Cloud Foundry and build a private cloud first, deploy all their applications on that, manage it that way. And then as services became or needed to become public, they would move the, into a, a Cloud Foundry based public hosted service. Right? Remember, we had cloudfoundry.com. It was free and it was a way for you to run your applications. That was the concept. We thought people would start private and then just move some of it to public uh, hosting. What's happening, wh this data doesn't necessarily show it uh, until you get down to the details, but what we see more is people are taking application services and building them from the ground up to be public cloud, you know, something that's running there. And it might be dependent on or work with something that's running inside the firewall as well, but they're separate services. And so they're not taking it first from a you know, on-prem and then slowly migrating it. They're actually building distinct services that are okay to run in a public cloud on top of existing uh, private stuff, stuff that's behind the firewall. So I think a hybrid cloud to me, uh, it's still going to look like you're running, it may not be Cloud Foundry, but you're going to be running some sort of internal private cloud for all your stuff that's cloud-based and then the services that need to be public or you can run publicly, you're going to have them there instead. And the key to hybrid is that it's, it means it's not they work together. It's not this app runs here and this app runs here. It's one app that actually runs in two different places, right? Or parts of it. What's open OpenStack? Um, well, clearly OpenStack has done very well. I, I can't give you much of a current opinion on it, but you know, two or three years ago, we thought OpenStack was, was going to die. You know, this, we thought Red Hat has invested a lot of money in it and didn't think it was going to make it. To us, we're, we're agnostic about it. We don't really pay attention. And we honestly don't ask the question, what, what kind of private cloud software are you using? You know, are you using Cloud Foundry? Are you using OpenStack? We don't ask those questions. We probably should, but we don't. So. Are you using OpenStack? I'm not. Oh, OK. Anybody here using OpenStack? So I was the developer of OpenStack mobile computing, computing engine. Oh, OK. I'm one of the contributors. Cool. So, <laughs> Uh, the experience that I have with uh, actually when speaking to multiple CEOs in the banks is mostly they are interested in not on the IS layer but yeah. on the PaaS layer. Right. They are not even thinking about this containerization. Yeah. You know. So they say that we have these developers. They know how to write good code. Now give me a platform that will leverage, uh, you know, improve the time to market basically. Right. Improve the time to market. You don't, you don't want to deal with any of this containerization. You deal with it. So either PCF or OpenShift or a Blue Mix. Right. Put it over there. Get right. the bundle. Put it over there. Yeah. Maybe OpenStack will be used by these platforms. Exactly. As an underlying uh, open. Uh, so as an underlying as layer, IAS layer, but not on the not developers or DevOps doesn't want to deal with this yeah. because uh, the APAs or you know they are not at. Uh, the level of the developers that we love to do it here. There's a lot of infrastructure tooling and everything is required to set it up. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, uh, I think I have just a couple more. Is there another question? No, all right. So, cloud strategy. Um, it's kind of a follow on question to the prior one. So, on prem, have no plans to move to cloud, 31%. And most of this was you know, large infrastructure companies, big, big, big enterprises. I think the percentage that in that 31%, the percentage that came from the 5,000 plus was 60%, so mostly large companies. Second, similar number, or same number, but uh, you know, running your applications in the cloud. A lot of startups here, a lot of small companies, right? But that's just where they started. They didn't even bother starting on-prem. And then 
you're seeing some, some uh, movement towards cloud native strategy. It's similar to what I shared earlier. And then finally, the last one is just kind of, we're not there yet, but we're looking at it a year out or a year plus out. And how many here are running applications already in a public cloud right now? How many are doing it all on-prem? No public cloud at all. So a couple, all right. Yeah, so I think this is similar to what we're seeing in the data. Why? Why are you keeping it on-prem? It's a good question to ask, and not a surprise as to, to the reason. Security, biggest concern. Compliance, of course, if you're in some industry where you've, you can't make things publicly available, you just don't have a choice. You know, and actually the third one's a valid one. Some don't need it. I mean, in the future, don't need it versus you want to continue to invest in all that operational infrastructure and operational people. Seems kind of foolish, right? If you can run it in a much more efficient way in a cloud and it doesn't have one of those first two concerns, you know, security or, or compliance, why keep it on-prem? And then, of course, people just reluctant. Okay. This was an interesting question. How much influence do your teams have on your company's architecture and technology choice? So this wasn't just cloud. This was all of the questions we've asked so far. Who has the influence on the, de the decisions of what gets used, right? Um, and, and the question is targeted at developers. So 40% a lot. You would think so in smaller companies. Developers have a lot of say. They should. Developers, if you ever read the uh, book Kingmakers or the New Kingmakers by Stephen O'Grady, you know, developers get to decide what gets, what gets used. That's absolutely happening. Some still, um, this, these two, 100% in the big enterprises. So <laughs> that wasn't a surprise. But it's starting to change. But literally, the ones that said zero, they all came out of the large corporations. Do you know the breakdown of these results according to the roles? This was just asking the people who surveyed about developers, right? So if you're an architect, the question was posed to you, do your developers have a say, right? Or if you're a manager, do your developers have a say? It'd be interesting to just take the developers and see if they think they have a say and then take you know, The data is there. We probably just need to slice it. But this is everybody. So yeah, thank you for clarifying that. OK, last summarized. Takeaways, you know, agility is not just about the developer agility. It's also about how you operate. So in a reactive-based system, I was telling somebody this the other day, that you know, reactive isn't just about the constructs of how you build an application, how you think about its, its architecture and how you develop it. It's also how you deploy it, how you maintain it, how you're able to iterate you know, in an agile way. And that means operations or DevOps operates in a much more agile way than what, what historically they would have done. One way to get there is through microservices. It certainly helps. It's not the only way, but it certainly contributes significantly towards it. Think of what you need to do to move off of those big monolithic app servers, right? And I'm not just here to tell you to stop paying Oracle or IBM or one of those guys, but for, for these agile microservices-based apps, putting them on top of a big heavy container just doesn't make sense. It's certainly not Legon, right? It's not the right size. <laughs> Think about data. You know, so many of the new applications, data is at the center of it, and data that is literally in motion, data that's live. It's not just querying an old relational database. It's actually data streams coming from IoT devices. You, know, you might have uh, an IoT-based platform, or maybe IoT is just part of it. Either way, that data, you can make use of it in real time whether it's, it's anomaly detection, or it's decision support, or it's literally the application itself uh, maintains those devices, and it's dealing with the, the data that comes from those devices in real time. And then finally, think about data as being fast, not just you know, mini-batch. Spark is great. Spark is mini-batch. It's way better than MapReduce on Hadoop, right? But sometimes you want it even faster. You want lower latency. You want literally very, very fast uh, processing of the data. So if you can do it in a way that doesn't require any, any latency or delays, then um, do so. That's it. This is available on our website right now. I just checked before I came in here. So if you go to the website, just do a search for the report. I don't think it's on the home page right now, but you'll find it. Thank you. So any, before I wrap up, any other questions? Yeah, I think we have time for Q&A. Sure.
Yeah, I think the question you're asking, I want to make sure I get it right, is is non-blocking a requirement for reactive? Yes. Yeah, okay. If blocking normal, normal, uh, normal uh, transaction, yes. is that any advantage to that reactive? Yeah. So I'm going to give you my answer. I'm not Jonas Bonner or Victor Klang or one of the guys that you know wrote ACA and wrote the, the manifesto. The reality is you can get very reactive and still have some things that are blocking. You can still have, in fact, it's really hard to have a complete system top to bottom that is 100% non-blocking, right? You're probably still querying some database that's synchronous and blocking and you're just, you're stuck with it, right? So if, if, you, if you want to have a reactive-based system, there are times when you just flat out can't. Even if you try to rewrite things, it's not possible. But even still, there are some some functionality, some parts of applications that work fine in a blocking way. There's no reason to rewrite them or re-architect them. Struggle through trying to build a, an asynchronous way. We've done it, right? And we've literally faced uh, both customers as well as our own technology challenges where some things just flat out have to be blocking. So, But to be truly reactive, 100% top to bottom, it's got to be asynchronous and it's got to be non-blocking. So I guess I gave you both answers, but, yeah. but the reality is it's not practical. Yeah. In every case, it's not practical. Sure. Yeah, I have a question about Lightband's future and strategy. Uh, you, you recently closed the Series C funding of $20 million. Mm -hmm. So I guess my question is, is it going to impact your strategy somehow? Are you, are you going to work on new products like Lagoon mm -hmm. and provide new services, things yep. like that? Yeah, so it was our it was a Series C funding round. It's kind of a typical Series C for a startup. This is my ninth startup, so I've got a little bit of experience. Um, when I say typical, it's at the point where you're, you've proven the technology. You've got customers who are using it and proving that it has real value. Now your job is to scale, to scale both the growth of the, the technology adoption, so the open source project work that we have to do and community work, but also the business. You have to scale the business. So the, the money we took was to help us on both those fronts. Uh, prior to that, if you look at our makeup of the company, we're 105 people right now. We've doubled in size in 12 months. We were 50 people 12 months ago. Um, and we were 59 people in January, so we've added 40, whatever that is, 46 people since January. The company is still 50% engineering, actually slightly more engineering. It's a, there's a lot of software that comes out of Lightbend, and we're not the only ones who build it. There's a lot of community members. I'm sure some of you are contributors, but we still have to have a very heavy engineering team, and especially if we want to build new technologies that, that add to the platform. So Legome is new, and there's a new team. It's James Roper runs it, and he was the play lead, now he's the Legome lead, but he's brought in new engineers. We'll do the same thing. I can't share too much because a lot of it's kind of early stage, but you will see some other technology that's, that's net new from Lightbend. Um, and primarily to further the ease of adoption, the ease of kind of getting this stuff, not just using it, but getting it into production, building applications that actually you know, meet your business needs. So a lot of investment on engineering. Um, in fact, that 20 million, we're not gonna spend it all, fortunately, we'll be at cash flow positive before it's gone. And that was the other goal. Don't, they don't wanna have to go out for funding again. And you know, there's always something that can come up, but the plan is not to have to do another funding round. That we are at a point where we're growing fast enough on the business side uh, that we can make heavy investments, but still get to cash flow positive before we need more cash. But yes, we'll put quite a bit of that towards engineering and we'll grow on the classic go-to-market side, right? Sales and marketing. So. And, uh, sorry, in terms of consulting, so you, uh, I guess one of your added value is that your, your expertise on Scala. Yes. So when you support big Java shops, are you really just doing that? Or are you also trying to convince them and uh, yeah, it's choosing Scala and, and more light band technologies? The reality is we never try to convince somebody to use Scala. But if the question comes up, this piece of functionality, can I do it in a more effective or efficient way with Scala than Java? We're going to give an answer that's honest, right? 
but if you look at most of our customers, the people that are engaging the company, they're at Java. They want to build it in Java. They've got Java developers. They don't want to have to spend the time to learn Scala. And we help them with that. So if you bring us in for training or you bring us in for consulting, you're going to get it in Java if that's what you want. And we won't pitch Scala to you. But if there is interest that you want to learn, maybe learn a new language or you want to build some of this in, in Scala in a functional way, we'll help you. Yeah, you have to experience it, though. I mean, if you would asked the company three years ago, I might have said that, but in practice, we were all Scala, right? We actually have Java engineers now. We have Java consultants. We didn't three years ago. Sure. Who's going to set the direction for Scala? It's a great question. Uh, how many people have heard of Scala Center? I know you're not all Scala developers. So, Scala Center was announced or launched just about four months ago, um, shortly after we changed the company name. And Scala Center is the beginnings of a foundation around Scala. Scala is completely owned by EPFL and Lightbend. We jointly own 100% of it. Um, we control it, if you want to call it that, but it's a community-based project. The compiler team and the current, whatever the current distribution is, comes out of Lightbend. Contributions come from other people, and they get to you know, submit them as a pull request or just as ideas. But the distribution, Scala 2.12 RC1 that just came out the other day, that was 100% delivered by the Lightbend team, Adrian Moore's team. So now to get to your question, who's going to direct Scala? It's still Martin Odersky. It's still Martin, and now Scala Center is a way for people to get involved. So the Scala Center, the concept behind it was that we were going to officially announce an organization, a nonprofit organization, whereby individuals can come to contribute code or people can contribute money. And right now there's 11, I think it's 11 Scala Center sponsors, we're one of, of course, where you give money and you get to um, give a priority list of things you want to see, things you want to see in the future. There's no guarantee that it'll make it in there, but it's, it's the beginnings of kind of a community-based, uh, not a meritocracy like Apache, but a community-based effort to, to allow others to contribute and make their set directions. But ultimately, it's, it's still Martin. You know, it's Martin plus the team that's at Lightbend, the rest of the team. So, so in your opinion, then, how do you see the type level and the contribution from there? So the good news is type level is not only made great contributions in Scala 2.11, there's some features that went in, and now Scala 2.12, there's quite a bit that came from them. They have historically done it via just pull requests that go to Adrian and his team. Um, with Scala Center, they can get involved with a, a piece of functionality, whether it was the shapeless library or something like that, so that they want to invest in. And then that can either, if it's going to go into the core, they have to submit it as a, um, I just lost the name, yeah, the yeah, letter, SIP process. Thank you. Couldn't remember what it's called. You submit it into the SIP, SIP process. And that's been restarted since the Scala Center. It kind of died for a while, but it's been picked up again just in the last four months. Type level also just recently committed that they're going to use the the current distribution, the Lightbend distribution, and maintain compatibility with it. So you won't have a fork anymore. So things that they build would be additive to Scala, but it'll be based on the current Scala 2.11. I don't know what the last release is or 2.12 when it comes out. Can you Alex? give us some preview of something cool coming in the language itself? It seems that all is packaging, modularizing kind yeah. of stuff. Is any yeah. be coming anytime soon or something like that? Um, first off, I'm not qualified to really tell you what's coming next. I can tell you what's in 2.12. 2.12 was all about making it completely compatible with Java 8 and you know, making it work better in the Java environment. You know, we did a lot of translation work before in Scala to make it work on the JVM. Now that Java and the JVM support some of the things that have been in Scala for a long time, we don't have to do that anymore. So there was a lot of work in 2.12 to just clean up the, the library, clean up the compiler, to not do all this maturations that used to have to be done. 2.13 will have a lot of new stuff in it. And there is a, I don't know if it's a, just a blog post or if it's in the SIP stuff, but there is a blog post that Adrian wrote that kind of outlines some of the things coming in 2.13. I encourage you to read that. Um, I can't even rattle off any of them, sorry. <laughs> there's, there's some interesting things, and some of which come from, from the guys at type level. You know, they've done a, a good job of contributing code, but also giving us ideas. Dimitri. My question is about Apache Spark. Uh, I know that uh, IBM made some kind of huge investment into this technology. Right. And uh, could you please describe the relationships between Lightband and Berkeley and Databricks and uh, IBM as well yeah. as an investor? 
Well, Spark obviously has really exploded on the market. Um, you know, it's really only a three-year-old project, and now people don't even talk about doing things with MapReduce for new projects, right? And Spark is bigger than just one piece of software. We've been involved from before it was even a project, before it was you know, something you could find. It was the AMP Lab guys were working with Lightbend because it's written in Scala, and there were things in Scala that they needed us to do. So Scala 2.11 actually had some functionality that was specifically for Spark. In the REPL, there was a bunch of stuff we did in the REPL for the, for the guys at Databricks. So once they announced the project and the company was launched, um, our involvement was still there, but they, they had a company now and they had funding and they could do a lot of work. They came back to us with only requests around Scala. That continues today. But Spark is much bigger than Databricks. Spark is, as you said, IBM, Hortonworks, Cloudera. I, last I looked, there were tw 12 different vendors or companies who contribute to Spark. Um, so not just Databricks. Databricks still happens to have most of the engineers, but Databricks is building data scientist tools and, and not focused on just the core of Spark as much as they are that. Our relationship is to make sure that Scala really works well with that. And the Scala API is fully supported. So you can use Java with, with Spark, right? You don't have to use Scala. We make sure that the Scala interface always works. And then whenever there's a problem in Scala that is, is represented or shows up in Spark, we have to fix it. We have to deal with that. IBM happens to be very heavily invested in it. They're building all their analytics stuff on top of Spark. Um, and they happen to be using the entire Lightbend platform to do that. So, uh, what's your take on uh, managing open source projects? Uh, so, for example, you mentioned that uh, uh, Play Aka uh, owned by Lightbend, and uh, for example, uh, Spark is Apache project. So, so yeah, so I have a lot of history with Apache. Um, I got involved with Apache in 2000, so Apache started in 1996, essentially, but 98 when it really became known. Um, <clears throat> Apache is a great place to not only get lots of community involvement, but to see projects grow into other projects, right? So sort of seed a project that ends up becoming more than that. The downside to it is, is that it's really hard to f keep a individual team focused on a goal, on getting something delivered. So if you think about Spark, they didn't go to Apache until Spark 1.0 was done. So it was completely built inside of AMP Labs, thank you. <clears throat> and then brought to Apache. And I, I spent time with Matei and, and uh, the team over there before they made that decision just to understand the consequences of it, right? Um, I think it was the right thing to do. They had to, because all the Hadoop stuff was already in Apache. And that's the second part of the question you have to answer is, what, what's your technology's ecosystem like? Where does it live? And what other technology is going to be used around it? If you looked at Akka or Play, Akka in particular, three years ago, there was not a lot of other open source projects that depended on it. Now there are plenty. I mentioned Flink. Um, even Spark has a little bit of Akka in it. So it's, it's changed in kind of its ecosystem around it. But when I got to the company, it was a standalone project, and it made sense for us to keep it that way. And we had some goals for it that I was, I and Jonas and others were nervous that Apache wouldn't really allow us to do. Because you lose control when you put it into Apache. There's a ton of benefit, but you lose control, right? You now have a community that gets to be involved in it. So, so my opinion is you have to know where's your technology going to live, what's it going to be used with. Um, do you have the wherewithal, the investment, to actually move your project from inception or idea all the way to something real on your own? If not, then Apache is a great place to take it, or Eclipse, or, or Linux Foundation, or one of the other ones. But if you do have the ability, then there's not any hindrance to, to doing it yourself, as long as you allow communities to get involved. And if you look at our projects, Today, Play has the most external contributions. Probably 60% of the code comes from somebody outside of the company. Uh, then next is Scala. Scala happens to be, well, EPFL, if you take them out of the equation, it's still probably 30% of it is coming from outside. Akka has the least, but we're changing that. I don't know if you've seen the Alpaca project, which is a, a new announced community effort. Probably 10, 12% of Akka comes from the outside. Maybe a little bit more, but not much. Um, and that's, it's both a combination of the way the team works, but also just the fact that there aren't that many people interested in contributing to Akka. Legom, which is new for us, uh, today only has about 10%, but we expect it to be like play, where it's going to be more than half comes from community members, individuals. And we certainly welcome people to contribute. All things from Lightbend are under the Apache license. 
So you're never going to have a GPL or other bullshit licenses that make it so it's impossible for you to you know, do whatever you want with the code. So, so what's you all the plan for, for Hacker? Uh, you consider it done that you just don't no. want to develop it anymore? No, and, not at all. Uh, Lots of development around Akka. Around you know, streaming, obviously, was a big investment for Akka Streams, um, clustering prior to that. And there will be other things that you'll see come from us. What I meant is that we, when we started it, we didn't think we could get very far if we'd have put it into Apache. Could we now? Sure. Do we need to? I don't feel like we need to, but you know, there might be a time in the future where it makes sense. Good question. It's, it's a, not an easy answer. I mean, literally ask that so, ourselves that all the time about the project. Does it make sense to keep this to ourselves or, or take it to Apache? So, if anybody here uses Spring, right? Spring's not an Apache. It's an Apache license, but it's, it's all controlled by the, the Pivotal guys. Always has been. Yeah? So two questions. Uh, as a library developer for Scala, so when I develop the library, I have to you know, target the versions of the Scala. Like, you know, I, have to work, I have to produce the artifact for these versions, my two versions. So will Dotty has any vision to simplify the life of a library developer? Yeah. You heard of Tasty? Is it Tasty? I always get the name wrong. I think it's Tasty. Anyway, it's an abstraction layer between Dotty and, and the core compiler. Um, that is one of the objectives of Dotty. I don't think it's, it, it's not explicit in that we will always allow for you to build the one and then it'll be able to be run or compiled to different versions of Scala. Um, it's a great question for, for Martin or for Adrian or somebody. I'm happy to ask it for you if you want, but I don't, I don't know the answer except to say that there is a stated goal to make it easier to have. There's this fear with the banks. The libraries keep changing. The, the value provision of the right ones and wrong is lost because it changes. I cannot change yeah. my underlying tool chain yeah. so easily. Yeah, so I can give you the answer Adrian would give you, and that is that we've, for the last three years, been investing to try to rationalize the library to something that's going to be consistent going forward, right? So put things in modules, put things outside the core so that they can be added as needed and leave the core alone. Get it to where it, it, it can be maintained going forward and can be something that you can depend on. Um, so it's been a heavy investment from Lightbend and from the community, but Lightbend really spent a ton of energy in the last three years on just that. Um, and Dottie introduces a, another complexity as well as possibility for addressing that. Because we have seen this complexity in Scala base, so now Dottie will increase the complexity? Not, this, yes. The goal is the opposite, to not increase it at all. I say it increases it only because it's also not going to be binary compatible with Scala 2.x, right? So that's, that's the com complexity side of it. But it should be easier going forward from that point. The second point is about the runtime data structures and optimization. Like, people keep complaining that the developer tech is being killed because it's so slow. Yep. Uh, and even the runtime data structures are like too, too many data, data types at the runtime. So is there any optimization Yes. Um, does it address your specific needs? I don't know. Uh, but yes, lots of optimizations in the compiler and dealing with everything from data types to you know, anything else that we can find. So there's the incremental compiler probably has the most improvement. Um, if you haven't played with that, it's, it's gained a lot of performance improvements, but also just not as many bugs, not as many issues that you used to run into. Happy to take your questions and send them directly to the right person. I don't want to try to <laughs> give you answers, but uh, if, if Adrian or one of the guys on his team could give you a better answer, I'm sure they they would. And the nice joke is that uh, Scala compiler minus Bitcoin under the hood. That's your monetizing strategy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Well, thank you. Oh, sure. Sorry. I'm sure there is one more. Maybe just one last question. So we can wrap up. Okay, actually, I have a question. Sure. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. <coughs> you go, how do you guys hire engineers? Like, let's say I'm a Scala contributor. Yeah. Are you going to hire me because I need contributions? Yeah. How do you do it? Yeah, I mean, 
certainly historically, when we wanted to add to the teams, the individual teams, we looked at who had made contributions, who seemed interested. And contributions are just code contributions. You answered questions on Stack Overflow or on the forums. Um, if you look at the engineers that we've hired in Play and Akka, they've, they've been individuals that were known in the com community. They either were involved through code or through responses or speak at conferences or all of the above, right? But we've also shifted in, in our thinking that, we, I mentioned it earlier, we need Java. We need people with Java experience and not Scala that can actually answer not only questions to our customers around Java, but actually make sure that we support Java, right? That, that Akka does a great job of providing an API for Java and Play and Legome and all the other technologies. So we've hired a number of engineers. I'm trying to think of the number. I think we're about seven this year so far, engineers. And four of them are not Scala developers at all. Now they're learning Scala because we write things in Scala, but they're, they come with a Java background. Um, we're, I think I mentioned it earlier, we're in 18 countries. We hire people where they're at. We literally look for the talent that can help us with the need that we have. And the teams, there's, there's no single team all in one location. The Aka team used to be, but they're very distributed now. Uh, the Play team used to be all in Australia, and now it's Australia, New Zealand, and California. So we're very distributed. Uh, 105 people in 18 countries, not something I brag about, but because obviously it's operationally tough. But it shows what we, what we mean when we say we hire where they're at. We don't force you to come move to San Francisco. Now, if you want to move, happy to have you in San Francisco too, but it's not a requirement. And we have job openings, lots of them. So <laughs> I think I saw nine postings for engineers uh, on our site just the other day. So we're looking for technical leads, looking for uh, Java developers, fast data developers, lots of people. And then our customers. One of the things we're very proud of is we promote our customers' job positions. So you can see, I don't know if PayPal has any more up there, but they used to have some job site or job postings on our site. Lots of companies. Hiring, right? Asking for people that, that have skills using our technology. So, just one thing, and for the community as well, I just want to take a note as well. Uh, Payback has also open sourced a Scala, I mean, on top of Scala, we have made a framework called as Scopes. That's right. Yeah, we've we heard about it. Yeah. So, it's basically it's built on top of Akka, but with some customizations, which PayPal says it could be good standards, right? So we have open sourced it. Maybe you guys can try it out for la building large scale web applications. So I just wanted to let you know as well. <laughs> so research for you. Why they use this spray instead of using an ARCA HTTP or an ARCA I can answer this question. Because the first versions of Scubes uh, were before ARCA HTTP was introduced. Oh, OK, fine. And uh, from the next version of Scube, there will be no compatibility with spray. I mean, we are more than, we are in I have just stopped it, but they just wanted to let the community and maybe Yeah, no, thanks, thank you. What's the name of it? Scoops. Scoops. Yeah, I think last time we counted, which is now about nine months ago, there was about 120 projects, uh, open source projects built around the Scala ecosystem, you know, around Akka, around Play, around Scala. Um, that are available, you know, they're open source. Of course, a lot of them come from Twitter and LinkedIn and Morgan Stanley's open source one, Goldman Sachs has a couple. So, but um, always looking for more contributions from the community. We need to do a better job as a company of promoting those, you know, that these are out there. All right, thank you very much.